Hey everybody, thank you for joining us today. We pray that this message reaches you wherever you are at today in whatever situation you are facing. We pray that the Lord ministers to your life. Hang on till the end, and I want to say a couple more things to you before we're done. I want you to stand this morning. If you got your Bibles, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 5. We are in a series called Vital Signs. This is actually our last sermon in that. And uh, I want to encourage you the next couple weeks, as you come back, we're going to be talking about Um, We're in a very interesting spot in our nation right now with everything going on. Some of you may not know this, but we have this thing in November coming up called an election. Um, But the truth is, what what does God say about all these things? About us, not just about politics, but really about us as a church. And so we're going to be talking about the next few weeks this topic of united because I believe the enemy is doing everything he can to destroy us right now. We're going to be talking about united, the power of we, and we're going to be talking about what does it mean, what is God calling us to be. So I'm going to encourage you to come back and be a part of that. But today I want to end our sermon series on vital signs about who we are as a church. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, beginning with verse 16. Are you ready for the word of the Lord? Therefore, from now on, we regard no one according to the flesh. Even though we have known Christ according to the flesh, yet now we know him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. Old things have passed away. Behold, all things have become new. Now all things are of God, who has reconciled us to himself through Jesus Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is that God was in Christ, reconciling the world to himself, not imputing their trespasses to them, and has committed to us the word of reconciliation. Now then, we are ambassadors for Christ. As though God were pleading through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in him. Father, we thank you for your word right now. Thank you for your word that is changing us and challenging us. And Father, right now, just pray through the power of the Holy Spirit that your word would go forth. Thank you for changing lives. Thank you for ministering right now and making a difference. In Jesus' name we pray, and everybody said amen. Turn and high-five somebody and say, Jesus loves you and I'm trying, and you may be seated. are you? Who are you? It's a question that I think many times we wonder about ourselves. Who are we? I was recently in the grocery store here in town and I walk in sometimes I don't know anybody and sometimes we could have church and take up an offering and do all that in the middle of the grocery store. I walk in and actually Samantha was standing there at the getting her groceries, so I said hello, and then behind her was an older lady in our community that doesn't attend our church, but I've known for a long time, so she walks up, and I give her a hug, say hello, and then I go around and get my stuff, and I'm getting ready to, to, to go out, and I mean, to check out there, and while I'm doing that, somebody behind me goes to the church, I'm speaking to them, somebody in the other line I know, I'm speaking to all these people, and I finally turn around to the young man who's checking me, I don't know him, and he doesn't know me, he looks at me and says, well, somebody's popular today. And he said, who are you? And I said, I'm just a pastor here in town, and I just happen to know a lot of people. He said, oh, that makes sense. The question is, who are you? I think sometimes we think we are the sum of our mistakes, the sum of our past. We define that word, who are we? We think, well, I'm the guy that blew it. I'm the person that messed up. I'm the person that has all these things going on. We think we are our circumstances. I'm the one that's struggling in this area, and I'm the one that's doing that. But according to what Paul says right there in Corinthians, that when we come to know Jesus, we are made a new creation in Christ. Old things have been passed away. Behold, all things have become new. you've done wrong. You are not your past. You are not every all those things. You aren't even the nicknames that people have given you over the years, but you are a new creation. You are the head and not the tail, above and not beneath. You are who God says you are. Amen? And that is important because when I know who I am, then I operate out of a place of knowing who I am. I operate differently because I know 
who God has called me to be. Now this morning, for the next few minutes, I want to talk to you about who are we as a church? Who has God called us to be? What does it mean to be a part of a, of a healthy church that understands who we are? That church, I told you the last few weeks, is more than just the number of people sitting in seats. It's more than just the number of people that say they attend Landmark Church. It's more than all of those things that God has called us to be a healthy church. And I think it's important to know who we are because as we know who we are, we operate out of that calling. And so this morning, I want to talk to you about our five core values. Are you with me? Say amen this morning. Number one, we value relationships. At Landmark Church, we value relationships. Now, we believe the most important relationship you'll ever have is with Jesus. That every road may lead to Rome, but there's only one way to get to the Father, and that is through Jesus Christ the righteous. Jesus said, I am the way, I am the truth, I am the life. No man comes to the Father except through me. And so we believe that the way I get to know God, the way I understand, the way I go to heaven one of these days, the way that I live my life and to be a Christian, it, it's not all these other religions, it's not all these beliefs, it is through Jesus Christ only. He is the the way he is the way that we come to know the father amen so we believe a relationship with Jesus is really our heart's greatest desire it is what you are longing for it's what your soul is looking for it is what you have always been looking for and as you come to know him he transforms your life but our vision statement is transforming lives through relationships because we believe it starts with a relationship with Jesus, but also we believe that the way we grow, the way that we come to understand our faith is not just me and Jesus, but it's also with a relationship with other people. That as I have a relationship with somebody else, we build each other up. We strengthen each other. That we sharpen each other. And that we need each other. When you come to Landmark Church, you're part of our family. You may not like that. You may say, that preacher reminds me of crazy cousin Eddie. I know I'm not supposed to know who that is, but here's the thing. That's fine. Here's the thing. You may think I'm crazy, and that's okay. All of us got the crazy family members. If you don't have one, you are one, okay? So just understand today this, that when you come to Landmark Church, you are part of our family. We walk through things together. If we know what you're going through, we'll be there. If we don't know, we can't help you. But if you tell us, we will walk with you through the seasons of life because we are in this thing together because we are called to relationships. We are called to be the family of God. And so because of that, we walk through life together because we value relationships. Amen. Number two, we just added this a few years ago, and it's my, it's my favorite, is we value joy. And here's the reason why. Because if you stay here long enough, you're going to hear people laughing. Okay? If you stay within five minutes, you're going to hear people laughing. And some of you may say that's crazy, and that's where I had a guy that I knew that used to say that, that jokes were not of God. He was serious. He said, the Bible says that whenever I was a child, I thought as a child, and whenever I became a man, I put away childish things, so you shouldn't be joking. And I wanted to say, sir, joke's on you, because God has a sense of humor. If you don't believe it, go look in the mirror. I promise you he does. <laughs> but the truth is this, the joy of the Lord is our strength. That there's something about having joy, that when I have that, the old song, that joy bubbling up out of us, there is something about joy, there is something about laughter that changes the atmosphere and a situation. And I believe we're called to have joy. There was a, a study done years ago. It wasn't scientific. I know some of you are the, the, the kind of people that say that can be debunked. You're right, it can be de debunked quickly. But I still like the idea of it. They, this has been years ago, and I can tell you how I know because they watched Laurel and Hardy movies. So it's been a long time ago. But they literally went to a hospital where people were suffering with the same kinds of things. And they let some of them just go through a natural healing process. And then some, they put on Laurel and Hardy and watched them laugh. And literally the ones that laughed in the, the, that hospital progressed quicker and healed better when they were laughing about things. And the Bible says, a merry heart doth good like medicine. 
A merry heart is like medicine. And I believe this, when I understand that I have joy in my life, yes, I go through difficulties. And listen, if you're struggling today, we will weep with those who weep. But in the same token, we're going to rejoice with those that rejoice. We're going to laugh with you. We're going to have joy. I believe the Christian life is called to be joy, unspeakable, and full of glory. I believe, listen, just because you become a Christian doesn't mean life has to be boring. It doesn't mean I give up having fun. If you can't have fun at church and laugh at church, where should you laugh at? And listen, some of you, I understand, you look at me like you're mad all the time. Some of you go to sleep. I'd rather you go to sleep and look like you're mad all the time. But you know what? I'm going to keep telling my dad jokes. I'm going to keep being goofy. I'm going to keep trying to make you laugh because I believe the joy of the Lord matters and it's my strength. And so we're called to have joy. I got joy when I think about what he's done for me. I could have Mike play that. I could take off on that for about two seconds, but I'm not going to. But yeah. I got joy when I think about what God's done. And so we value relationships and we value joy. Amen? Number three, we value being spirit-led. We value being spirit-led. Romans chapter 8 verse 14 says this, For as many as are led by the Spirit of God... These are the sons of God. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God, these are the sons of God. Think about this. As I I was studying this week, I just got got to this one verse and it just hit me. Something I don't normally see when I read this. I love Romans 8. But Paul is saying, you want to know what it means to be a child of God? That sons of God is gender neutral. It's for men and women. Okay, So ladies, you're involved in this. What does it mean to be a child of God? He said, for as many as are led by the Spirit of God. You know what the mark of a child of God? They are led not by their own flesh. They're led not by their own lust that they want. They are led by the Spirit of God. And I believe this in our own life. We are called to be led by the Spirit. I am called to put down what I want. We sang earlier, I give up my ambitions. We are called to lay down our ideas. And we're called to say, okay, Holy Spirit, whatever you want for me, you've got it. Holy Spirit, I am yours. Here am I. Send me. Lead me. Guide me. You are the Spirit of truth. And I will let you because guess what? To be a child of God means we are led by the Spirit of God. Amen? But it means the same thing in our church. It means that the the Holy Spirit is what leads our church. I understand people have to be involved. I understand humans have to make decisions. But listen, every, every meeting we have here, whether it's a board meeting or a staff meeting, whatever, I try to say, Lord, whatever your will is, we want it above everything else. Because listen, we are called not by people. We are called not by a denomination. We are called by the Holy Spirit. He is building his church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. And we're going to let God do his thing, all right? You understand? Understand, we are led by him. The Holy Spirit has the right to do whatever he wants, whenever he wants. We, we get up before the first service, the worship team meets. By the way, let me just tell you, you don't realize some of our volunteers get here early in the morning. The worship team's here before 7 a.m. preparing. But we go in this room and we go over the order of service. And we say, this is what we're going to do. But listen to me. The worship team understands this, that the Holy Spirit has a right to break in whenever he wants and do whatever he wants. Matter of fact, I had a different sermon plan till Friday. I had different points and the Holy Spirit said, you do this. And I said, I only have a couple hours, but yes, sir, we will get to it because guess what? The Holy Spirit is the one that writes the agenda. The Holy Spirit is the one that is leading us. And we believe at Landmark Church, we are called to be led by the Spirit of God and led by the Holy Spirit means we surrender everything to him and let him lead us and guide us. Amen. So not only do we value relationships and joy and being spirit-led, but number four, we value all generations. It bothers me whenever we go, I go to a church, and I've been to both. I've been to some where it's all older people. And I'm going to say this. This is one of those jokes that some of y'all are going to say, that's terrible. You should never laugh at that, but I'm going to give you permission. But I've been to some churches. They were a couple funerals away from closing the door, and that's being honest. Okay? I'm being honest. That's just the truth. And I've been to some churches where all they had was young people and there was no wisdom in the room. 
And listen to me, we are not called to be a church of either or, we are called to be a church of both and. That we're, we, need the, the, we need the energy of youth, but we also need the wisdom of older people. We need the wisdom of saying, you've been through some things, and you've walked through some things, and because of that, you've got some things to share. We need both of those things, and we believe we are called to be here for all generations, that we're all called to this thing. Now, the Bible says this, your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your old men shall dream dreams, and your young men shall see visions. It's all of us. It is all of us recognizing we are called to this thing. I don't care how old you are. At 80 years age of age, Caleb said, give me this mountain, and God used the king at 8 years old, a man at 8 years old to be king. God isn't looking at your age. He is looking at your availability, and he says, I want to use all generations. Amen. Here's the thing about it. An old African proverb says this. When an elder dies, a library burns down. When an elder dies, a library burns down. You've experienced this in your own family. Grandma's got the recipe to all your favorite Thanksgiving meals, and she doesn't pass that on, probably because, like my mom, grandma didn't remember the recipe. She, I'd say, what do, you, what do you put in there? A little bit of this. How do I measure a little bit? Probably a fourth a cup. Well, my, mama probably doesn't help me when I'm cooking. It don't taste the same because you put a little bit of this and a little bit of that, and I'm putting this and that, and it don't make no sense. <laughs> but what happened over generations is things pass away with the generation before. And listen to me. Let me grab an illustration real quick. I only get to do this this service, so I'm going to do it in here because she's only in this service. Yeah. Look at there. Not supposed to spit out, spit out your past here. Are you wanting to amen or something? So you got to get your mouth ready. Here's what Matthew chapter 10 says, or excuse me, I'm sorry, Psalm 145. I'm getting ahead of myself. Psalm 145 says, One generation shall praise your works to the next generation and will declare your mighty acts. Listen to me. The reason that it matters is because we have generations coming up. I don't want Everly Jane Blankenship just to hear about what God has done. I want her to experience God in her generation. But it starts with me passing it down to the next generation. It starts with me declaring. It starts with me. I'll be, I love to hold my kids when they're down here, but I'm going to lift my hands up while I'm doing it because I want them to know Daddy knows how to worship. I want them to know that Daddy knows how to pray for folks. I want them to know that we're going to do this together that one generation shall declare to the next generation this is what God has done this is how good God is that God is a God that will minister and listen to me I believe until Jesus comes back the goal is we're going to see this passed down the Bible says there was a generation that grew up in Israel that did not you clapping for me ain't you sister amen I love that thank you there was a generation that grew up that did not know God because guess what they didn't get it passed down to them they had heard about it a long time ago. And I've said this a thousand times, but I'm going to say it a thousand and one right now, that Christianity is one generation away from extinction. If we're not careful, we will lose the ground we have in, in the next generation because we pass it off and think you can learn on your own. And listen to me, we are called to make sure the next generation. So some of you, I'm going to say this to you in a nice way, you are seasoned saints. I'm going to say that to you kindly, okay? The seasoned saints, we need you to pass down to the next generation. And the next generation, they need to step up and say, it's my turn and I'll do some stuff too. I'll help out and we're going to stand shoulder to shoulder. We're not going to stand apart from each other. We're going to be in this thing together, but together all generations generations are called to stand and we're going to see this generation know Jesus in their own way. Their music may be different. They may worship different than me and you, but guess what? I'm telling, I'm prophesying this about myself 30 years from now. Guess what? I'm not going to run them out because they're different than I am. I, as long as they're worshiping Jesus and the message still is Jesus Christ and him crucified. If the message is still the Holy Spirit is alive and well, then guess what? My, my opinion can get out of the way because I want them to know God for themselves in their own way. Amen. Thank you, sister. Whew, that scared her. Amen. And number five, we value generosity. Now, some of you, when I said generosity, you just grabbed your wallet and your hand book there, whatever. You grabbed your purse and clutched it. I'm not talking about 
I'm not talking about money. I'll talk about that in a few months. I believe money does involve generosity, but listen to Matthew chapter 10. I want you to hear this. This is one of those this week as I'm studying, just left off the page to me. Matthew chapter 10, verse 7 says this. And as you go, preach, saying the kingdom of heaven is at hand. Heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. This is the one verse. I went looking for this one verse, the end of this verse, and I didn't think about what preceded it. Freely give, freely you have received, freely give. As I'm studying this week about generosity, I'm thinking, my, the, my thought went to that verse. Like the Holy Spirit brought that, this, this one line up to me. Freely you receive, freely give. That's what generosity is. But I didn't think about the other part until I went and read the whole verse. And Jesus is saying this. He's sending out his disciples. And he's not saying, freely you've been given money, so freely give money. He's not telling us not to give money either, but his point is not about that. His point is, you have been given so much more. What is your responsibility to generously give it back to others? You've been healed? Go pray for somebody to be healed. You've seen God set you free from demons that you've been hold, that have been trying to hurt you for a long time. You see somebody else set free from that. There are areas of your life that God has done remarkable things. And what is our job? Freely we received. I haven't done anything about it. I didn't earn this. I didn't earn salvation. I didn't earn his goodness. I didn't earn any of that. It was because of his blood, because of his grace and his mercy. And because I have freely received, now I'm called to freely give. I'm called to give back. And this morning, I want to speak to some of you because you're wondering, who are you? Who am I? This morning, I want to tell you, you are not what people say about you. Matter of fact, let me say something to you that I should have said with the generations, but I want you to listen. Some of you right now, you come from a, 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 a bloodline that for generations your family has struggled with something. You've struggled in areas, maybe with addiction, maybe with, with poverty, just can't seem to get out of any of these things. Maybe you say, my family's never wanted to have anything to do with, with education. My family has just had a lot of problems in my life, abuse, whatever it is. But you listen to me this morning. I am declaring over you today, you are not the sum of what you've done or what your family did. But listen to me. Some of you, you can say alcoholism ran in my family, but it did until it hit your generation, and it's about to be different. Abuse ran in my family, but it did until it hit your generation, and it's about to be different. Addiction ran in my family, but listen, it's about to hit you, and it's going to be different. And this morning, you need to recognize who you are. And listen to me, began to give that out to others. You have been given an opportunity today to make a difference, a different legacy. You have been given the opportunity today to say, you know what? My life is going to be different because of this. And today, People may recognize you by your old self. You walk up and you say, hey, remember when we did this, this, and this and began to name all these bad things. You can say to them, say, I've got the same thing God has. You realize God has something? Because God is imperfect. So to say he is forgetful in and of itself would be odd because he's perfect. Here's what I believe he has. I believe God has spiritual amnesia on purpose. God chooses to forget our sin. He takes our sins and he removes them and he forgets about them. And he says, you know what? I have amnesia. When you say, well, God, don't you remember last week when I blew it? And he goes, no, you repented. I don't know what you're talking about. It's under the blood. I've covered it. You, you've been set free. You're, you're, that thing doesn't hold you back any longer. And this morning, some of you are holding on to some things you need to let go of. At Landmark Church, we want to see you help, help you become everything God has called you to be. We value relationships because we want your life to be about Him and about growing. We value joy because we want to laugh with you and walk through life and have a good time doing it. I don't want anybody to say, when I become a Christian, I had to give up having a good time. Listen to me. You don't even know what a good time is until you had it in the Lord. We value, uh, we, we understand and we value all these other things. What was number three? Somebody help me. I'm looking at my own points. Thank you. What's that? What's that? Number four, we value all generations. Oh, spirit-led, thank you. We value being spirit-led because we believe that your life is not your own. 
but God wants to lead you. And I believe that we value all generations and generosity. And this morning, if you'll step into the calling God has on your life, man, eye has not seen nor ear heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man what God has in store for you. But some of you need to let go of some things and begin to say, this is who God has called me to be. God's called me to this church, this place, because we're together going to become everything God has for us. Would you stand up this morning? Hey, everybody, thank you so much. We are so honored that you chose to join us today for this message. And our prayer is for you and your family that you would be uplifted and encouraged. If today you receive Christ or if you would like to give to the vision of Landmark Church, if you would go to our website, www.landmarkchurchok.com, there's more information there, how you can do all of that. And also, if you have a prayer request, please let us know how we can be praying for you guys. We love you and hope you have a blessed time.